Lord God, help us as we study the Word to be transformed by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand what you have to say to us, uh, despite the words of a preacher and those who speak to us. May this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi church family, it's good to see you this uh, evening, if you're joining us on Wednesday night for the Bible study, but it's good to see you whenever you're joining uh, us, and uh, feel free to leave some comments or questions in the comments below on Facebook or on YouTube, and hopefully I'll be able to get back to you with some answers. As I lead you in a Bible study, I must say that I don't know everything, and I'm learning as I go, so I trust that you will you will. Uh, be interested in what I have to say and I trust that this won't be too boring because I know that sometimes I get interested in something that nobody else is interested in. My name is Angus Kelly. I'm a minister in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. I have a master's degree in theology from the University of Stellenbosch so don't uh, let that reflect on the university but hopefully that'll give me some credence uh, and they'll probably be ashamed of, of some of the stuff I might say. No, they're very supportive but uh, just to say that I, I do know something about what I'm talking about and I'm not afraid sometimes to say that I do not know what I'm talking about. I thought that it would be a good idea to start a study on the book of Romans. Now the rules of the study for me are that I'm not going to say okay I'm going to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and get through the book of Romans in three weeks. I'm just going to read uh, Romans with you and study uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter and go as far as we can go in about 40 minutes, half an hour, uh, once a week. Also, I'm going to start from Romans chapter 5 instead of going through Romans chapters 1 through 4 first. So I invite you to read up on, on chapters 1 through 4 on your own. I'm starting at chapter 5 because many agree that this is, this is perhaps one of the most important uh, and succinct um, chapters of Paul's writing that kind of sums up much of what he believes, much of his theology in a, a short chapter. Quite nice, nicely written, but important to acknowledge and, and record the context in which it's written, which is the whole book of Romans and Romans chapter 1 to 4. So we'll start with a little overview of 1 to 4, touching on that, but that's for your own reading. Uh, so from Romans chapter 5, we begin and with verse 1, therefore, since we are justified by faith. Now, therefore, since we are justified by faith, refers obviously back to chapters 1 through 4. And chapter 4 is the one that really speaks about how Abraham is justified by faith and what that means. Abraham's faith is to trust God, as God calls him out of Ur, to, to start a, a new nation. Abraham's faith is about how even in his weakness and his old age, he and Sarah had a, a baby and he still trusted God for the coming of that child, who would be Isaac, who would be uh, an ancestor of all of the people of Israel, the children of Abraham. There was a problem in the Roman church in that the, the, the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians were a bit divided over who was who was the best kind of Christian and did you have to be a Jew to be a Christian or could you also be a Gentile to be a Christian? So there was some animosity and some difficulty in getting along. So Romans chapters 1 through to 4 speak of this argument, uh, sort of imaginary dialogue between Paul and, and somebody who argues against about how Jews and Gentiles both belong in the family of God, in the kingdom of God. So perhaps uh, chapter 1 verse 16 is, is a good summary introduction to the whole book of Romans. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And the gospel is good news, euangelion, the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. So to trust God is, is to receive the power of the gospel, and that's enough power to save you. Salvation doesn't just mean, you know, a ticket to heaven, but it means a, a transformation of one's being from, from being any old somebody to being a child of Abraham, a child of God, and to reflect that beauty of God into the world in which you live. To the Jew first, he says, and to the Greek. So he does give the, the Jewish Christians a little bit of priority there, reminding everybody that the message was first transferred to Abraham and came through Moses and all of the descendants up to this point. 
but now also through Christ and the message that Paul has proclaimed to Greeks and everybody else. For in it, that's the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith. We can trust in God's righteousness revealed through our trust in God because God is good. So like Abraham trusted that God is good and he went out on a limb because he trusted that God is good. So we too can go out on a limb and trust that God is good and we can live by faith. An argument again against the, the legalistic way of living and against and towards living in freedom in Christ. And that would bring us then to Romans chapter 5 and we will also come back and visit this part of Romans 2 again. As I work you'll hear my mouse clicking and things and I hope it's not too much of a bother. So that brings us to Romans chapter 5 verse 1. And when you see a word like therefore as the beginning of Romans chapter 5, therefore since we are justified, um, we are reminded to go back to verses to chapters 1 to 4 and remember what has gone before. And in short, Paul has argued that um, that all have sinned and that's a reminder to us that all can be justified by faith. So Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift. Now, I think the interesting thing that we often misunderstand, or perhaps that I have a different opinion, is what it means to have fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, as a youngster, I was taught that it's like if someone was shooting an arrow and they didn't quite hit the mark, they didn't uh, shoot very well. Or that there were all these laws and rules that you had to keep, and nobody could ever keep them well, so that everybody fell short of that glory, of that target. And I think it's important that we understand what what it means to to speak of the glory of God and what it means to to fall short of the glory of God, which I don't think is that is that meaning in terms of falling short of the goal, but rather not quite bearing the image of the glory of God that you are supposed to bear. So when we go back to Romans chapter one verse twenty two, claiming to be wise, they became fools. In verse twenty three, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God. For images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. And as we read through uh, Romans chapter 1 and further, there's kind of this imagery that you become what you worship. And so the people worship things of the earth, and they became very uh, enfleshed, um, obsessed with the flesh, and, and, and full of lust, and all of these things, because of the worship of idols. And so... The idea of the image of God to which we should aspire is of reflecting the image of God in our human person, of being the kind of person that God created us to be. And Jesus shows us what that kind of person truly is, as he shows us the way of love and justice and peace. So fallen short of the glory of God, which we read about in Romans 3.23, is not so much about sort of uh, shooting the arrow and not keeping all the commandments, but rather about not living up to what you were created to be. So then Paul goes on through chapter 3 uh, to chapter 4 to talk about being justified or made right with God through faith. And an illustration of how you become right with God through faith comes to us through the example of Abraham, who by faith does what God calls him to do. Uh, by leaving Ur, leaving his father's wealth and his father's house and going to do what he should do. So Abraham in, in Romans chapter 4 goes to do what God calls him to do because he trusts in the character, in the nature, in, in the person of God more than, more than anything else. And that's what it means to, to have faith. And the mystery of that is that we are justified by that kind of faith. That kind of faith that says Jesus can die on the cross and my sins can be forgiven because of what Jesus has done. God loves me just as I am and I am able to become a part of God's family on earth. And as part of God's family on earth, I am able to, to live up to that image in which I was created. created. 
So Paul uh, also another beautiful image that Paul uses is from 1 Corinthians um, chapter 12, chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. That sense that now we don't really know fully what God looks like and then we'll see God fully, but also that we will become the people that we are, are meant to be. And the greatest gift that, that's a sign of our becoming the people that we're meant to be is the gift of love in our hearts that helps us to become what we're meant to be. And so this idea of the image of God that we receive by faith, restored to our person, is um, is what it means to be justified, to start to be healed, to be brought back to the picture that we were created in. So, unpacking from chapter 4, we go on to talking about the consequences of what it means to be justified. And so Paul writes, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the words for, for having peace, it's interesting that, that um, many of the earliest manuscripts have a, a construction of the word that would say, let us have peace rather than um, we have peace. So it's an invitation to, to remember that we have peace with God. But at the same time, there's also this idea that we, we have peace that has been brought about through what Christ has done. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is a reminder that, that it's Jesus and our, it's what Jesus has done and our faith in Jesus that reminds us that we are in good relationship with God. We are in shalom relationship with God. So peace in, in the Old Testament language especially doesn't just mean sort of the lack of war but it means shalom, having everything that we need in God, being one in, in, in a kind of close relationship. And we have this relationship through Jesus Christ, as we go on in verse 2, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. So we are standing in grace, but we don't just stand in grace as we go on to to see what Paul has to say we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God we don't just stand in this grace but we we move forward boasting in our hope of of the glory of God now I think it's quite interesting to read uh, Eugene Peterson's translation sometimes if you want to get a, a sense of, of the words that Paul is using, because some of them aren't so easy to, to translate in a simple phrase that's, that's quick and, and easy. And so as we go on to this verse 2, he says, We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. And so we start talking about what it means to boast in our hope, as the New Revised Standard Version and the NIV Version of the Bible will say, is not so much this idea of boasting that we have in modern language, where we we think that uh, it's kind of saying, yeah, I'm better than you and, and what I've got is so much greater. But rather boasting about the, the good thing that God has done that we receive. So boasting in, in the sense of what Paul is saying is not meant to be boasting that, that you are great or something, that there's something about you, but boasting in God, boasting about what Jesus has done giving all glory to God for his grace. And so we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. That hope, as I said, is not just standing, but moving. And so then Paul goes on to say, which I think is perhaps a little bit confusing, that we also boast in our sufferings. So this whole 
language of hope speaks to us about what Paul has been speaking again in uh, Romans 4, where he speaks about what Abraham did and how Abraham received righteousness. In verse 18, he believed that he had become the father of many nations. Um, and he didn't weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which you'll see is something important just now. He s maintained faith and trust and hope and carried on on the journey because of his trust in who God was and not in terms of his own health or strength. So, sorry, I went back to the wrong passage there. So back to Romans chapter 5. We boast in our hope of sharing in the glory of God. We also reminded of other promises that Paul reminds us of, of the kind of, of hope that we have in, uh, say, 1 Corinthians 1, where um, we are reminded that he will strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of Jesus Christ. Another reminder that God will continue to work in you until the job's, job's done and you are made as you ought to be made. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which is also another beautiful uh, reminder of the fact that God will continue to work in, work in you until the job is done. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and that language sanctify you entirely means that you'll be made entirely holy you'll become the person that you're meant to be you'll be sound and blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ so we're talking about this image of god restored in the human being you are being restored by god you can have hope in god because of the nature of god not because of who you are, not because you're a descendant of Abraham by biological descent, but you are a descendant of Abraham through faith, just as Abraham became part of God's family through faith. He listened to God. He went where God was calling him to go. He continued to trust God because he trusted in the nature and the person of God. We continue then uh, back to Romans 5 and on to verse 3, where it seems that Paul then starts to think about all the struggles and sufferings that the people are going through. And I guess that part of what people complained about at that time was if there, were, if there was anyone who wasn't um, observing all the rules and keeping all the laws, they would have said that perhaps you're the reason we're cursed, or perhaps you're the reason we don't have good fortune, or, or perhaps we don't, we're not going where we ought to be going because of your faith or, or you so so the gentiles would perhaps blame the the jewish christians and the jewish christians would blame, blame the gentile christians and they say you're not keeping all the rules god's not favoring us god's not loving loving us and we're being persecuted because of all of these things now paul if we read more of paul especially in acts we realize that he suffered a lot and it seems that he was doing god's will so we can't associate um uh, having everything that you need with being blessed by God, but rather we know that, that God's goodness is not dependent on our provision. So going on about boasting, we can still boast in our sufferings. If we read it more closely and carefully, we can realize that, that boasting in our, our sufferings is not so much about... Um, boasting about the suffering that we are going through, but we can boast in our hope of the glory of God that comes through in our suffering. So we boast in our sufferings because we're boasting about what God is doing, not about our sufferings. We boast to ourselves, we continue praising God, and we know that our sufferings will, will, will pass, but even as our sufferings come past us, they actually have the potential to bring about change in us. And we can become the people that God created us to be. So endurance is produced through suffering. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Also, that language about suffering is is uh, language that that reminds us of the persecution 
of the Christians. So in Acts chapter 11, we see this word for suffering is thlipsis, which is a word for trouble or pain that people go through. But back in Acts 11.19, it's differently translated. And it's always interesting to see how one word can be translated and used in different ways. So this is the same word here, persecution, that is used for suffering, thlipsis, in, in, the, uh, in the Romans reading where we talk about boasting and suffering. So it seems to be a word that that connoted not just persecution and suffering, not just suffering in the body, but also this persecution by the Christian community that bore up against this kind of persecution together and um, experienced God's grace and love even in difficult times. So this talk of character being formed also, the words for endurance and uh, for character, are kind of words that can kind of mean um, steadfastness, um, sort of stickability, and also character means grit. So um, in James chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, the word for, for, for character, that's also an interesting word, is, is, is the same as the word for testing. So James 1... because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance so um, there's another use of that word for character which is a bit hard to pronounce um is also the word used of the the man who said he couldn't go to the wedding feast because he got some oxen and he wanted to test them so he wanted to see if they would hold up against uh, tough situations um, and so character is, is more than just sort of uh, somebody who's nice to be around, but it's somebody who has a, a sturdy character or maybe like a deep keel that will keep them um, steady on the water, so to speak, if you use a fishing and uh, a sailing analogy, somebody who is sturdy and, and, and good to rely on. And so he continues, hope does not disappoint us because of God's love. And this begins a section of chapter 5, which is um, continued through to verse 8, again, speaking about God's love. So sometimes they call this an inclusio, where we have two um, sets of concepts of this kind of love, which is agabehe love. And all of this that is in between these two uh, words about love are words about what this means. So thinking about that from verse 5, hope does not disappoint us, reminds us of part of the Te Deum or the Song of the Church which ends in Kosa if you sing it, Nkosi di Tembe when di Tembe Wena Ma Dingaze di Daniswe. O Lord my hope is in you, let me not be disappointed or dismayed. And that's not a, a a reflection on God saying God might let us down it's a way of saying I will not be let down because I'm able to put my trust in God it is also a word that reminds us of um, of of not being put to shame so in the Greek equivalent of the Psalm 22 the Psalms were written in in Hebrew but Psalm 22 verse 5 says let me not be put to shame uh, and were not put to shame because they trusted in you, O God. It's the same kind of language and the same kind of thought that that we will not be disappointed. God's, if we put our hope in God, we are, are safe and we can trust in God. And remember, this is all in the context of people saying who's saved, who belongs in the kingdom, who doesn't. All that you need to do is trust in God's nature and purpose and kindness to, to humanity, to know that you are are able to boast through your sufferings, boast in God, God's character through your suffering. You, you, you don't give up because you know God is good. And uh, let those sufferings and those trials that you go through produce that uh, long suffering and character, that, that depth of, of being, that strength of faith that you need, because hope will never disappoint us because of God's love.
And then we get to verse 5, which I always love it when speaking about the Holy Spirit. And, and one of the chief actions that the Holy Spirit does is, is pour into our hearts this love of God. But there is a, lang uh, a, a turn of phrase here, poured, that isn't fully translated in most um, most Bible versions. So it actually emphasizes poured out. So if we think of poured, we just simply think of, a, of an easy flow where something just pours in. But the, the language exeo, which reminds you of exit, reminds you that there is a source of this love that's poured into our hearts that is being emptied or drained. Now, that's interesting because God cannot be emptied. But God's love is emptying into our hearts through the Holy Spirit and lifting us up. And we speak about this mystery of the Trinity and think of the concept of kenosis in Christian thought. So when Christ offered himself on the cross, he emptied himself and offered himself as a sacrifice. He was pouring himself out on the cross, or maybe the, the, the word for exeo, for poured out, invokes the image of his blood being poured out. Pouring out his life in order to redeem humanity pouring out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which bears witnesses with us, bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God. And so then this language that continues in verse 6, while we were still weak, reminds us of what we read in chapter 4 about Abraham, who was weak, he was old, he's 100 years old, him and Sarai were 100 years old, they 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 laughed when they heard that they were going to have a child, but they still did. And and so so God is able to take the impossible and turn it into possible. And none of us can claim that we have somehow earned God's love by descent or by good works or anything because we weak and unable to do anything for ourselves. That word for weak is really about uh, about being completely sort of useless and unable to do anything. Um, that we can receive Christ's death for the ungodly. So ungodly also, that would kind of imply uh, the Gentiles more than the, than the Jews. So if we're thinking of the, the Jews, we think of um, weak. We're thinking of Abraham in this, in this analogy. And if we're thinking of ungodly, we're thinking of Gentiles, those who aren't belonging, but ungodly can also refer to those who, who have known God but have just ignored that, that good news. So there is this emphasis on God's love poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. While we're still weak, we're not able to earn this love. We're not able to do anything to, to deserve this love. And Christ is dying for the ungodly. That's us before we got to know about his love. And then a reminder that, that, you know, this is the nature of God. No one will die for a righteous person. You know, hardly anyone will offer their lives for a righteous person. And someone might offer their lives for a good person. But in verse 8, God proves his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's a reason to worship, reason to trust, reason to, to say, wow, this is an amazing and good God that we worship. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. Justified by his blood, we've spoken about that a little bit. You are just as if you had never sinned. And we're talking about blood as in the blood that Christ has shed for us um, to, to cover over our sins, to take over our sins. He's given his life, he's poured out his blood. And so that language that seems to play a little bit on the language of poured out the Holy Spirit and the love of God into our hearts. And we are saved through him 
from the wrath of God. Now, sometimes it's hard to understand language like the wrath of God because uh, we think in terms of human wrath. And wrath is the strong word, you know, you'll know my wrath. If I say that, I mean you're going to see my irrational and uh, unlimited anger because I'm really upset. And, and as a human being, I have very little um, self-control, so I could be really mad and really cross and irrationally mad. The idea of God's wrath is not that kind of, of, of anger, but rather the, the, the just consequences of, of our sin. So one image that I use to, to imagine that is imagine if you could experience all the pain that you've caused others. That would be fair, wouldn't it? But it would be terrible. All the emotional pain, all the physical pain, all the kinds of pain that you have caused to other people, you rightly deserve it. And, and it would be fair for them if God would exact that revenge on you. That would be wrath, that, that horrible idea of, of, well, it's kind of, it is a horrible idea because it's horror-filled, but it's also um, an image of justice. We're saved through Jesus, who, who's, whose blood takes a, into itself all of that anger, all of that brokenness, and then reconciles us to God. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more surely then, having become, been reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. And so this is beautiful. It's not just about being reconciled to God through the sacrifice that Christ offered on the cross, but actually about the life that Jesus offers and shows us through the way he lives, through the way he deals with people to save us. And not, not just that, but the life of the Holy Spirit that gives us life and power to become the people where we are created to be. We're saved by his life. And then again, language about boasting. We even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, that's a reference to the hope that we have. We're not boasting, like saying that I'm so great and everybody, everybody else is, is nothing. We're not boasting, saying God is better than anybody else or anything like that. We're actually saying that we boast that, that we belong because of what God has done. God has been good to us. We're boasting about what we have received. So it would be like someone, someone who received a, a beautiful, like a kid, received a beautiful bicycle and boasted about how wonderful it was. When he's boasting about that bicycle, he's not boasting about himself. Not even boasting about the bicycle, but perhaps boasting about the one who gave him the bicycle, who was so generous and kind. My dad's better than your dad, that kind of thing. <laughs> but not like that. We even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Language that reminds us that we now belong. We have been brought into relationship with God. We are part of God's family. We are um, the relationship between people and God has been restored, instituted. Uh, here you go. To reestablish proper, friendly, interpersonal relations with these after these have been disrupted or broken. So there we have it. Romans chapter 5 from verses 1 to 11. And next week we'll continue from verse 12. And thanks for letting me talk all this time and not interrupting me. Appreciate it. Lord, thank you for this word to us. We pray that we would know that your love is enough to pour out into our hearts and give us new life and new strength. And that we are able to live in hope even through suffering and struggle. To know that your love is enough to redeem us and to save us. And that we can put our trust in your death, through which we are saved, and your life, through which we are saved, become the people we are created to be. Amen. Mm -hmm.